Hi, I'm Colin McCarthy. Uh, I'm a senior principal engineer here at Amazon Web Services. And uh, today I'm going to talk about being a pragmatic cloud developer. Uh, one of my favorite books is a book called The Programmatic Programmer. And I'm, I'm borrowing a little from its title here. Um, but what I want to talk about today is just how, uh, you know, how to make decisions about what to use in the cloud or how to architect for the cloud and not being too doctrinal about that. Um, and this all comes from um, a series of articles that we put out uh, a year ago. Uh, it was starting a year ago. So at reInvent last year, we launched the Amazon Builders Library, which is this um, great you know, curated repository of articles um, that we've put up from first-hand experts here at AWS uh, and Amazon.com that get into you know, our lessons and our experience building you know, big systems like AWS or, or Amazon.com or Alexa or Kindle and so on. And um, you know, our articles get into all sorts of technically deep things like you know, how we do leader election, how we do things like exponential back off and retries or how we use shuffle sharding to build uh, highly available systems. And these um, articles aren't intended as, you know, you have to do it this way, or, you know, this is the one uh, special way that we've, we've found to build things, and, and we think it's the best pattern for, for absolutely everybody. It's not like that at all. In fact, even at AWS, we use different architectures and different approaches uh, to solve problems in different places, whatever makes most sense um, for, for, for that service or that team. And this certainly applies to customers too. So, you know, I wanted to, to want to wanted to make sure that as we put these articles out there that are like, well, here's our experience building a cool thing or, or a great way to solve a problem that it, it you know, didn't have the effect of, of people being like, well, because they built it that way, then I have to build it that way or, or, or that's the only right way to do it because it's not like that at all. And so I put out this tweet earlier this year um, asking people, hey, what, what are the techniques and patterns or things that we do you know, and other big providers that, you know, maybe make sense for us, but don't make sense for everybody, right? Um, and it's got a lot of responses. I got hundreds of responses to this tweet. It was really cool. And it was kind of awesome to see inside and, and, and get a picture from people about, you know, things folks are skeptical of or things folks have found don't, don't work for them. It's very illuminating. And there was kind of a common theme to the responses, uh, which, uh, which I liked, which is that, you know, at, at AWS, uh, we vend infrastructure. It's our core business. It's something we get um, very excited about. Um, you know, we, we think infrastructure is very important, very critical to the success uh, of anyone's mission out there. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's important to remember that infrastructure isn't the thing, right? It's a means to a thing. Right. And what, what I mean by that is, you know, at, at the end of the day, users and customers have to be served and infrastructure is just a means to that end. And what ultimately matters is serving the needs of those users and customers. Right. Whether that's getting a package delivered to the door with Amazon.com or, you know, streaming a video or what, whatever it is that the business built on top of us um, does. And, you know, Endless tinkering with infrastructure doesn't actually deliver any business value, right? And it's important to remember that and, and, and to always make decisions in that framework of like, well, what's ultimately, um, what's ultimately going to move the needle for, for actual customers? How are we going to deliver more agility or savings or, or whatever it is? You know there can be anti there, be, there can be cultural anti patterns that matter here, so you know so, some folks out there you know like to build absolutely everything themselves and they've got these not invented here cultures, you know that's not particularly healthy. Uh, uh, but the opposite isn't healthy either. You know the opposite of like well we're not going to build anything ourselves and we're just always going to use uh, some some reference material or, or we're going to point to how somebody else has done things and we're always going to copy them you know, does, does not work either. Instead, we have to be pragmatic, right? And we have to really think through what actually makes sense for us right now 
about how we're going to build things. And there's a bunch of trade-offs that have to be made as we make those decisions. So, you know, a classic kind of trade-off space are the trade-offs between availability, scalability, productivity, and cost, right? You know, you can, you can get enormous levels of availability and scalability by spending an enormous amount of money, right? Just have a huge amount of resources and be extremely over-provisioned, but maybe not the smartest trade-off. Or similarly, you could spend a lot of time optimizing everything, right? But that might be a huge drain on productivity and you're not really delivering um, business value and maybe those optimizations aren't earning back, um, you know, the investment that's being spent upon them. So, you know, just with these trade-offs in mind, uh, we can reach different decisions that are valid for, uh, for different uh, customers. Another thing that can influence decisions is just the phase that a customer or a business is at. So most new technologies or startups or, you know, anything that's been, been built from scratch and hopefully gets popular tends to follow something like an S-curve for adoption. So it'll grow quite slowly at first then hopefully it gets to some critical mass inflection point, you know, really takes off, grows quite quickly, but eventually gets to some point of like, you know, market saturation or get, gets to a point where kind of everybody who wants it, you know, has it and then growth slows down again. And the decisions people make at different points in this curve can be very different, right? So for example, early on, you might choose to, you know, I don't need to optimize too much because right now my, my focus is growing. And I just want to acquire customers and earn their loyalty as much as possible, get big fast, and then leave optimization for later, right? And, uh, and then the type of business, too, can also influence, you know, what kind of decisions make sense. You know, startups uh, hopefully follow that kind of curve we just saw, you know, start off small, grow quickly. Um, but, you know, uh, small, medium enterprises don't always follow curves like that. You know, maybe a a long running business that has a loyal customer base um, that grows at a very different rate. And so the needs of the business are different. Or government agencies, you know, their customers are typically citizens and the growth rate in citizens tends to be, you know, the birth rate or the immigration rates. And those are quite steady and, and modest compared to, to the growth rates in, in things like uh, technology adoption curves. And so again, their, um, their, their rates are just very different which can influence decisions. Another thing that can influence decisions there is, you know, because government agencies have to be accountable to citizens, their funding models can be very different, right? And they don't always have the freedom to make huge investments up front that um, may deliver larger savings later because that's just simply not how government funding always works, right? Sometimes it's, it's more short-term budgetary uh, focus. And then, uh, enterprises can be uh, very different, you know, so a, a large enterprise, maybe their core business is delivering finance or insurance or energy, right? And their, their needs are, you know, the, their technology needs grow with the size of the employee base, you know, like the IT department is there maybe to facilitate those employees and help them be productive. Um, and and that need, you know, may only grow at a certain rate, may have uh, different availability characteristics. You know, for example, uh, their their availability needs may not be as critical at night or on weekends. You know, a lot of uh, IT shops sometimes feel free to have schedule and maintenance windows and so on, which again influence the kinds of architectures and uh, technology choices that that they can make. Uh, that said. There are some patterns that I think um, almost always make sense or, uh, for, for kind of any size of customer or any, um, any phase of business growth. So I think most people would agree that um, it's table stakes to have security in place. You know, the cost of a security or data breach is just so high, whether that's measured monetarily in terms of liability or whether that's measured in actual harm to people from, from their data being compromised. And it's just considered kind of baseline professionalism that we have to have security in place. Uh, similarly, I'd say we have to have working backups and restore. You know, somebody could log into a system and, you know, run a delete query and forget the where clause and all of a sudden all the data in your database is gone or they can format the wrong, you know, disk drive. Mistakes happen, data disappears, right? A business 
can't just end because of a mistake like that, right? So again, it's considered baseline professionalism that we just have to have those things. I'd say these days too, especially if you're on it on it on on AWS, uh, having resilience and redundancy is is baseline, uh, especially because it's generally pretty easy. So, for example, you know if you use um, multi AZ or DS or ELB as as kind of core architectural primitives, you get uh, availability zone redundance and uh, resiliency built in, right? With, without having to do much effort. So, kind of always makes sense to at least be resilient against things like, well, let's make sure everything works, even if an availability zone um, ha has an outage. And then I've included it here. Um, just as an example of a technological trend that almost always makes sense to adopt uh, is serverless, right? So some trend, some technological trends that can be really hard to tell, you know, is this just a fad? Is this something that's going to come and go in five years' time? Is there going to be another way to tinker with infrastructure that, you know, is going to be the, the latest and most popular way? Uh, to me, serverless feels very different. It feels like a very um, long-term, sustainable way that delivers real, you know, efficiencies and cost effectiveness to customers uh, to organize how they do um, applications. And the thing that's interesting about serverless is you can kind of start at any scale, right? You can you can start with the tiniest, single, tiny little function uh, or workload and just put that, you know, in say Lambda, and um, and build from there if you want. So at almost any phase in the business and almost any type of customer it actually is the kind of thing that you can adopt, unlike many um, other things that require quite big architectural shifts. So with that, um, I want to get into five examples of things customers have told me um, that uh, have made sense for us, but may not make sense for them. And the one I want to start with is actually one of the oldest things we've been raving about at AWS, which is eventual consistency. And so... Now, when I joined in 2008, um, this is something we were talking about a lot at the time. Something um, uh, was was uh, really cool in 2008. Still cool, but you know we don't talk about it as much. If you don't know what eventual consistency is, uh, you can read about it here on, on Werner Vogel, our CTO's blog, um, uh, and get more detail. But essentially, it's saying, hey, we've got a data store, like a database or, 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 or a system like that. And at a certain point, when you get a lot of things updating that database, it gets very contended because all of the readers are contending with all of the writers. You know, when uh, we want to update a piece of data to write to it, we have to lock out or block all of the readers uh, for the duration of that update. And then when the update completes, then the readers can succeed, right? That's how an asset database works. That's how transactions work. Um, and it means you get this very consistent view of the data right um but it's not scalable it doesn't always it can't scale to you know tens of millions of writes for example and um and so we pioneered eventual consistency where instead what we do is well we'll let the readers be a little bit behind the writer sometime you know like they're reading from a a, a slight cache for example right and and maybe there's you you make an update and then the readers will perceive that update maybe a few milliseconds later. And that, ten, that turns out to be very workable. You can build very large systems on top of this. It's actually core to building a system as large as Amazon.com. And we built this property in uh, to, to uh, you know, our foundational app, Amazon Web Services. So, for example, S3 uh, could support uh, a virtual consistency. And... Um, and you know, I would say you certainly need some eventual consistency for a system as large as Amazon.com, uh, but you don't necessarily need it for uh, all scales of system. In fact, most of our customers are nowhere near the scale where eventual consistency is truly necessary. And you know, together with like innovating technology and just increases in performance of underlying hardware, we've actually been able to bring. A strong consistency model to more and more services. Um, so while um, you know many of our 
early AWS services had these eventually consistent patterns built in. In a lot of cases, we've even been able to retrofit them and add strong consistency, strong consistency models, which mean you don't actually have to program against eventual consistency or think about them too much these days, uh, which is nice, right? So if, if you want to use uh, Amazon S3, you can actually treat it as a strongly consistent system uh, these days. You know, you can make it right and you read it back, it'll be, you'll read what you just wrote, right? Uh, Amazon Aurora, DynamoDB, uh, all offer this kind of um, read after write consistency. For, for cases where you truly need it, so for example, global replication, we still do offer eventual consistency. So if you're replicating data to like two, three regions that are all, you know, tens and tens of milliseconds apart just because of the speed of light, um, uh, there's a good example of where eventual consistency still applies and is uh, something we absolutely still offer and you can uh, still absolutely go use. Um, so the next pattern I have of something that we're huge on uh, and I still advocate for it, but you don't necessarily have to adopt is NoSQL. So um, before we had DynamoDB, we had a system called Dynamo, its precursor which I would say is one of the NoSQL pioneers. And um, the philosophy behind NoSQL was essentially, you know, SQL databases are great. They help you store and process data, um, but they can be a bit too magical, right? They can be a bit too clever for their own good, and they can hide really important details from developers. So some good examples of this are, you know, you can write a query that joins two tables, and without realizing it, maybe under the hood, that query is doing full table scans. And so as the data set grows over time, that query gets less and less efficient. But that's not obvious at all in the code review. Query looks exactly the same, right? And so the developer isn't really forced to reason about those scalability concerns when they're writing their application. In the NoSQL world, we make a lot of that more explicit. You know, we, we don't put quite as much quite as much magic in and we have the developer instead think about those kinds of uh, data explosions and joins. Um, I, in, another example of how a, a SQL database can be too clever for its own good is that it can actually change how it executes queries on the fly <laughs> with no notice. You know, it, it's got these internal counters and it's keeping track of how big tables are. And one day it can decide, you know, I was using this index before, but now I think this one makes more sense and just completely change the query plan on you with radical changes in performance. And those can be, you know, pretty invasive and, and have uh, stability um, challenges. And so at AWS, we ourselves try never to use SQL databases as much as possible. In fact, if you want to use a SQL database at AWS, you have to get an exception approved by Charlie Bell, our SVP who oversees technology at Amazon Web Services. And uh, it's not an easy exception to get. You have to convince them you're only using it over here in an area that isn't business or mission critical. It's for something like offline analytics or something like that. If it goes down, no customer will be impacted. You know, those are the kinds of criteria you're trying to satisfy. Not easy to satisfy. Uh, and yet we still offer <laughs> SQL databases as a service, right? We've got Aurora, we've got RDS lots of happy customers using those. We fully stand over them, we support them, we want people to use them, right? And the difference here is, is really just scale. You know, AWS is pretty much always at that scale where we're at risk of, um, of interacting with those SQL properties where, you know, query plans might change and so on. Most customers are nowhere near that scale. Like a lot of customers, um, you know, can use a SQL database solve their problems, have the magic, you know, be productive for them, not have to think about it too much. And, uh, you know, it, it, it works out being uh, a great solution for them. And if they get close to the scaling points, well, we, we have services uh, ready for them. Now, of course, I'd say if you're doing a fresh build and not, you know, maybe don't consider uh, SQL from day one, maybe consider something like, uh, like DynamoDB. But at the same time, if SQL solves your problem, great, good for you. Um, another popular response to my tweet was microservices. So Amazon also kind of famously pioneered uh, microservices. We decided very early on, you know, long before even AWS, 
uh, was around to organizationally architect ourselves as a set of autonomous teams who would each own a service that's kind of encapsulated by a contract and they could get other teams could treat them as a service provider. They could treat those other teams as customers. Uh, and it was just a great way to, you know, work in parallel and have um, all these, you know, developers building a, a huge system like Amazon.com without just, you know, constantly having to have a lot of meetings and constantly having to talk about how, how things are going to line up. They just get to kind of treat, treat each other as a service provider. And, um, but that doesn't, you know, absolutely make sense for everybody. Not everybody's at that scale, right? If you're just starting small, um, or you've got some existing monolithic services, you know, where everything's just built into one thing, you know, um, uplifting and, and just going to, to microservices doesn't necessarily make sense for everybody right then. Um, turns out you don't even really have to make too much of a trade-off here. Um, it's actually easy to, to move to microservices in a pretty phased way over time. So for example, if you've got a service today, it's probably behind a low balancer. Right, like ELB or ALB, you know, and uh, the low balancer can actually help you divide it up into microservices later if you want to, right? So let's say today all the requests come into the low balancer, they go to some instances to be served. Well, in the future, if you get bigger, uh, you might want to divide that up into the responsibility of several teams. You can actually do that in place, right? You can configure your low balancer with content based routing, and you can say, well, these URLs go here, these ones go there, and so on. And just divide it up into, into several microservices in place. You could do this with uh, ELB as your front end. You could do this with API Gateway as your front end. Uh, you can do it with CloudFront as your front end, right? So microservices aren't the kind of thing you have to adopt on day one. There is a path to adopting them later. It's not something you have to be uh, too religious about. The next thing I have for you, the next example, is network segmentation. So network segmentation, you know, we, we offer virtual private clouds as a feature. So you get to have your own virtual data center. Uh, well, we and some customers have realized, well, since they're virtual now, since they're basically free and I don't have to build a physical data center, I'm going to give one to each team, right? I'm going to put this team in their own VPC, this team in their own VPC, this service in its own VPC. I'm going to connect them all using peering or private link, or whatever, all works great. Uh, but you don't have to do things that way. Um, and if you, you know, don't have the network expertise uh, to, to match that, it's, you, you don't have to do it this way. Another alternative is shared VPCs, where you have a single large VPC, and then you use our shared VPC feature, which you know, leans on IAM policy and uh, service control policies to ring fence teams from each other uh, that way. And so if your expertise is much more in, well, I understand policies really well and security controls really well, that might be a better way to go than the network segmentation. Equally, completely, equally valid um, ways to segment uh, things. Uh, so you don't have to, again, don't have to be religious about it. Uh, the most popular response to my tweet, by far the number one thing, was actually uh, SRE, Site Reliability Engineering. Um, where a lot of customers felt like, hey, uh, just because the, the big providers have these dedicated SRE teams of experts in operations and automation, does not mean that that makes the most sense for me. Some, t some customers prefer to have developers running everything themselves, like a pure DevOps model, which we actually use quite a lot of AWS ourselves. Uh, some customers pr prefer to have a centralized IT team who uh, coordinate a lot for everybody. And there can be a lot of, you know, path dependence that uh, helps make this decision. You know, if a customer started out with a centralized IT team, it can make sense to keep it. You know, if everybody is used to uh, cooperating and working with that IT team to achieve uh, and deliver projects, no reason to change it, right? Or if that IT team or, or any other team plays an important role in you know, safeguarding the stability of the overall system, uh, it make, absolutely makes sense to keep that. It, d it doesn't always make sense to, you know, I'm going to have a complete cultural organizational change and I'm going to go 100% uh, SRE tomorrow and so on. There's no one right answer here. Um, 
we actually have a mix of, of several models ourselves. I'd say at AWS, we, we mainly have a pure DevOps model where most service teams just run their own services. And the developers who are writing code are the folks who are running it and responding to issues. But we do have dedicated operational teams and teams that are very SRE-like in their construction. And then, you know, in our um, you know, corporate side, facilitating our, our, our many corporate employees, you know, we've also got kind of a, a very IT team kind of uh, role model. So uh, I also have some honorable mentions, things that didn't make it into my five examples, but definitely bubbled up in the responses. Uh, Kubernetes was another popular one. Uh, a lot of customers felt that just because the big providers use a lot of cool, you know, Kubernetes and container orchestration frameworks and so on, uh, or, you know, sidecars and mesh networking and all of, all of that, doesn't mean it makes sense for them, especially for uh, smaller and medium-sized customers. You have seen estimates out there that, you know, a real Kubernetes deployment probably requires literally millions of dollars of, of uh, investment to, to, to really justify it. So you have to expect quite a big return on that. You have to expect it's going to deliver a lot of organizational agility and probably doesn't make sense at the, the smaller customer end of the scale. In other words, monorepos, essentially keeping all your source code in one big repository. We don't do that at AWS, so I, I won't defend it. Um, but some people felt strongly that's, that's something you don't need to do. Um, Full, fully continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, we do have that at, at Amazon. You know, I, if I check in code, it will be automatically be pushed through some rigorous uh, automated testing, and then automatically, you know, without any manual intervention, it'll be deployed to production in a slow, safe, phased way, uh, with potential for rollback at every stage if if anything goes wrong. Uh, it's I love it. It's great, but certainly not something you have to do. I would say don't skip on the testing. You know, always test your, your stuff before it goes into production. But if you've got manual deployment steps and they work for you and they suit your scale, no reason not to keep them. Uh, there's no reason to use multiple regions as a law. Uh, you know, we have customers who use multiple regions for high availability purposes, uh, for low latency purposes, and for data sovereignty purposes. And those all make sense uh, in, 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 in their particular cases, but um, you don't have to use them. You could, you could have a very highly available system hosted in just one region. Um, and if that works for you, great. Or, and then another one was infrastructure as code, right? You don't have to deploy your infrastructure using CloudFormation templates or CDK or Terraform or, or anything like that. If it suits you to be launching instances and load balancers and databases, from the AWS console, go for it. Great. Uh, I'd say do familiarize yourself with AWS Config and CloudTrail because those can help you, you know, if you ever screw up and make a mistake, uh, delete the wrong thing in the console, you know, you can find out what you did with CloudTrail and Config and undo it. So they're, they're worth learning for sure, even if, even if you're just using the console to deploy things. Um, well, you certainly don't have to you know, retool and go build all these templates um, just to feel like, you know, I'm doing things the golden cloud way now. Absolutely valid to use the console. That's what it's for. Um, thank you. That was all my examples over there I had. Hopefully that gives you a flavor of, I guess, the kind of pragmatic decision frameworks uh, we see succeed with customers. You know, we, we really don't want to see our experiences uh, become doctrine. Um, we, uh, we, we really want to always be learning from our customers and, and sharing those lessons and, and seeing what works for everybody. I'd be grateful uh, if you could complete the, uh, the survey. Uh, it always helps us to get feedback on these talks, to learn uh, what customers are interested in and uh, what we can improve for future talks. Um, thank you again.